first start with the current war in Ukraine, given that this is a war being not just prosecuted by a Democratic president, but supported by virtually the entire Democratic Party, at least on the national elected level. President Biden himself, who's conducting this proxy war, says the world is closer to nuclear Armageddon than at any point since 1962 because of this war. And yet since he said that, he's continued to escalate the U.S. role in that war. I want to ask you about the domestic politics in a second. But first, what about the war itself and the U.S. role in it? What do you make of that? There has been a certain number of uh, voices on the left, including yourself, um, who have gone so far as to say that the war was provoked. And you can hear statements like that from Professor Chomsky, from Professor Mearsheimer, uh, from Ari Mate, uh, what's the fellow's name from Columbia? His name just- Jeffrey Sachs. Like, yeah, Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, but there's always a, a, a limit to that criticism and the criticism always is, yes, he was uh, the Russians. I don't like to say Putin because it's the entire, uh, the entire political elite in uh, Russia who are supporting the war. And I think overwhelmingly the population, though you could say the population because they're manipulated uh, by government propaganda, so we'll set them aside for a moment. Um, the, the limit always is, yes, he was provoked. Yes, he was provoked. Yes, you could see a sequence of events beginning with the decomposition of the Soviet, uh, Soviet Union into Russia, uh, from Gorbachev to um, uh, Yeltsin to Putin to Medvedev. Everybody will grant that, but then there's a limit. And the limit is still the war was an act of aggression and the war has to be uh, condemned. Uh, I don't accept that limit. I'm not going to uh, squander your time now to going through my own reasoning, but I think the challenge is, in my opinion, of people like yourself. At what point, at what point does a provocation become so severe, so outrageous, that a country has the right to react? I remember, just to give you a kind of analogy, not perfect, but uh, an analogy, uh, you are too young, I think, to remember Probably. how it came about that the Black Panthers chose the Black Panther as their symbol. Uh, and the, the, back then, I could be mistaken about this, but my memory is because a Black Panther, if you attack it, it retreats. If you attack it, it retreats. If you attack it and it's back against the wall, it leaps out at you. And for me, that metaphor works quite well for Russia. They gave 30 years, 30 years, not a trivial period of time, over to trying to resolve this issue diplomatically. They made every possible effort to achieve a diplomatic settlement of the conflict. Now, it was not hard to resolve. In fact, it was very easy to resolve and a resolution would not in the least have impinged on Ukrainian sovereignty. It required just two things. Number one, NATO, not Ukraine. NATO could simply have said, given the apparent provocation or seen as a provocation by Russia, Ukraine cannot join NATO now. That's all. That's all they had to say. And secondly, to implement what's called the Minsk II agreement to grant local autonomy to uh, the Donbass region, the Russian-speaking region of Ukraine. If those two conditions were met, to my thinking, absolutely reasonable. Actually, I thought the most reasonable statement was made by your head of state before he became president, namely Lula. Lula was asked by Time magazine his opinion on the war in Ukraine. He said this was not a difficult issue to resolve. He was speaking then not about NATO, he said about e the EU. He said the EU could simply have said to Zelensky, not now. Now is not the right time. Now it's true 
Now, Lula also denounced... He did, I was Russian about to say. He did exactly the thing for which you're criticizing everyone else. He said... Right. But, but let me let me interject there then and, and kind of use Lula as an example, but also in kind of defense of my own position. I'm not actually that very... I'm not that big on making a big melodramatic showing that I'm condemning Russia or think Russia was unjustified in its invasion, though if someone asked me specifically for an answer, I will ultimately conclude it was unjustified. But I don't... You, you seem to be suggesting there's a kind of intellectual incoherence there and let me just suggest to you that for example i spent a lot of years saying that the kind of official explanation for nine why 9 11 happened namely the hate us for our freedoms and all of that was preposterous that of course there was provocation there as well we had put troops in saudi arabia which they regard as a heretical invasion of sacred land we had supported israel and their occupation of palestine not that osama, osama bin laden cared that much about that but a lot of his supporters did and most of all we imposed a sanction regime on on iraq that killed 500,000 uh children etc cetera, etc cetera, that we have been infringing in that region for so many years in so many different ways that of course there was something provocative about that and even the cia has a word called blowback which is where you if you interfere in other countries it's eventually going to come back to u.s soil but to note that doesn't mean you simultaneously i have to say that 9-11 was morally justified the attack was or that it was uh legally or ethically justified as well you can see provocation in what the west was doing in that region while still objecting to the path that was chosen and in the case of russia it could easily say if my argument was that the u.s had no right to invade iraq or vietnam or whatever without international approval in violation of the UN Charter, that's also true of, of Russia. But I, I, don't, I just say that to say I understand what you're saying, that sometimes people want to stay within the bounds of decency by saying, I hate Russia, I condemn Russia. But I don't think it's intellectually inconsistent either to both see provocation and view it as unjustified, the reaction. Well, there are many things to say to that. And uh, obviously, it's a fair point. But then you have to see whether the analogy works. Did Osama bin Laden spend 30 years trying to negotiate a settlement with the West over the issue of the Middle East? Did Osama bin Laden begin the war, as any war is begun, by targeting military targets? Now, you could say at some point, at some point, the war deteriorated and Russia, you know, predictably but inexcusably, probably engaged in what are called uh, you know, violations of international humanitarian war law, crimes. war crimes. Yeah. Yeah. No, correct. Fine. But that's not what happened. What happened was 30 years of negotiations. And it wasn't as if the situation on the ground was static. Had it been static, you could say, let them go, give the negotiations more time. But that's not what happened. What happened was, at some point, arms were pouring into Ukraine from NATO. At some point, NATO and Ukraine were engaging in joint military exercises. At some point, massive a massive attack seemed to be looming against the Donbass region. And then you have to ask yourself a, a simple question, though I admit the answer may not be simple. The simple question is, at what point do these provocations reach a threshold such that Russia has the, res the right to respond? And I would want to emphasize that what happened there has to be seen in the broader context of the fact that the generation that's now ruling Russia, the Putin generation, he happens to be within one year of my age. He's 70, I'm going on 70. That generation has very vivid memories of invasion and war. And Russia, in my opinion, had the right to say it would not tolerate nuclear-tipped missiles on its border 
within five minutes range of Moscow. Which was the American no, objection for the Cuban Missile Crisis, or very similar to it. And, but, but, Norman, no, but Norman, hold on, let me just ask you. So no. when I discuss this issue with supporters of the U.S. proxy war in Ukraine, or people who are all with their draped in their blue and yellow flags and the like, I present to them the alternative hypothesis that imagine China or, or Russia in Mexico changing the government of Mexico to a more pro-Moscow or pro-Beijing pro government the way the U.S. did in Kiev. Imagine tons of Russian or Chinese arms flowing into Mexico right on the other side of the U.S. border that are specifically designed to either deter U.S. forces or be used against it. I bet you most people who are saying that what Russia did is so unjustified would support U.S. actions against such a provocation in Mexico. They'd have no trouble seeing why that's very threatening behavior. But let me ask you that question. If China and Russia were as involved in Mexico in the same way as the U.S. is in Ukraine, would you support U.S. incursions, military incursions, into Mexico and then say it was a justifiable provocation? Glenn... The problem with these kinds of questions is, how well does the analogy hold? Did, did, was the United States the victim of an invasion from either Mexico or the other example that's commonly given, or Canada, in which a tenth of its population was exterminated? The Nazis waged a war of extermination on the Eastern Front. Did Mexico wage a war of extermination on the United States? Did Canada wage a war of extermination on the United States? But the U.S. was allied what, with Russia. I mean, you're, you're, you're basically molding, melding I, I'm German saying, history and American history and saying the, German, the Russians yeah. rightly fear Germany and therefore look at the U.S. and kind of attach German crimes to the United States. At the time, at the time, I don't want to go into the details now. At the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States was planning an invasion of Cuba. It was at that point that the Cuba, that the uh, Russian stage uh, station or stage uh, missiles in Cuba to fend off the U.S. invasion. There was a very easy way to resolve that particular issue. The issue was resolved by the United States agreeing to remove the Jupiter missiles from Turkey, the nuclear tip missiles they had in Turkey aimed at Russia, and to agree not to invade Cuba. There was a simple solution. The U.S. rejected it. Russia now put forth a simple solution. The neutrality of Ukraine, not to belong to an eastern military bloc, not to belong to a western military bloc, and to implement the accords that were reached to resolve the question of the Russian-speaking people in Ukraine. That, to me, is not a complicated question. It doesn't impinge on, in any way on Ukrainian sovereignty. It was a decision for NATO. Of to course, make. of course. And I, a different way. Thank you for the application, but we're rejecting that application. Exactly. The U.S. is not duty-bound to defend every country. That, of course, every country would love to be defended in a pact where the U.S. says, if anyone touches your soil, we will go to war in your defense. Everybody would love that. It doesn't mean we're required to give that commitment. And of course, the fact, I mean, of course, I recognize all of these things the United States government has done in Ukraine as provocative. And I never found, thought I found myself in the position where I'm doing this war with somebody that wiggled into that side of me that, that you find yourself in. But I, I totally understand the point you're making, which is, look, if you're saying that what the U.S. has done is so provocative, so repeatedly, as I agree, at some point, you have to say, well, the Russians got provoked. And uh, I guess for me, you know, the, the, the framework is, as I said earlier, that we need some kind of consistent rules about when countries can just send their military across the border and wage war on another country. But, but I think we went over that. Let me, let me just try and, in the name of time, switch gears just a little bit. I do want to ask you, because you mentioned this at the start, and I was going to ask you it anyway, because it relates to your book, about the domestic political component of it, which is that here we are kind of, as I said, in agreement on what usually in mainstream discourse nobody will agree on, which is that this war was provoked, that the U.S. at least, as, as Lula said, the West bears at least 50% of the blame. That's something I would agree to. Um, 
And yet you won't find anyone in mainstream left-wing politics, by which I mean to say even a member of the House of Representatives on the left, to oppose Biden's proxy war in Ukraine. The last time there was a vote in Congress, it was last May to authorize $40 billion more for the U.S. to spend on the war in Ukraine. Every single Democrat, Norman, every last one, Bernie, AOC, the squad, the House Progressive Caucus, everyone unanimously voted yes. The only no votes are about seven dozen from the kind of pro-Trump or populist wing of the Republican Party. Why is that? Why are Democrats united unanimously, at least on that level, in support of this NATO EU militarism and war? Well, I want to just backtrack a half moment. It's not that only that there are no dissidents, which would be bad enough. There are not even interest in, any interest in querying what's happening. You could have had House hearings. You could have had congressional hearings. Okay, I don't agree with them, but let's bring in um, John Mearsheimer. Let's bring in uh, Jeffrey Sachs. Let's hear what they have to say. There's not even a willingness to hear, to contemplate, to consider the other side or an other side. It is not necessarily the other side. There are various opinions. When Bernie Sanders, for whom I have to say, in, in recent months, my feelings about him have deeply soured. That Bernie Sanders, when he was asked most recently about the Ukraine, he says, well, I don't study it very much. Okay, fair enough. He's an older gentleman and he can't master every field, you know, bearing on a U.S. administration. But then he said, I trust Biden. I trust the Biden administration. Has Biden showed such excellent judgment in foreign policy? Was he an early critic of the war in Vietnam? Did he oppose the attack on Iraq? Where is this trust that now Bernie invests in Biden such that he doesn't even want to consider the possibility that maybe Biden might be wrong on this question. What is the answer to that? Where, is that? where does that come from? Where does that come well, from on the, the American I think, left? I think, I think in his case, the answer is simple. And I could understand the calculation. His calculation is I'm going to focus on the domestic uh, uh, agenda of Biden and try to extract as much as I can on that domestic agenda. And he recognizes that if he breaks ranks on Ukraine, he's going to lose Biden's ear. That's a trade-off that he made. He made that trade-off from the day after Biden was elected. 